okay let's try and understand the reaction here see this is the um, the British election results are coming in live okay as we speak so what it shows is clearly the exit polls are indicating a very strong majority for the Tory party which is the conservative party so historically the two big parties have been conservatives and labor okay the conservatives are called Tories so uh, now uh, they are coming and that's this uh, the pri existing Prime Minister current Prime Minister Boris Johnson who's a Tory Prime Minister he had actually camp he has positioned himself as a pro brexit candidate mm -hmm. and the labor guys are actually anti brexit okay they want to reverse brexit so that's the broad positioning although they're actually if you look at the treaty that uh, Boris Johnson has agreed with the EU they're actually it's not a clean brexit they're, it's quite a messy brexit so it's not a very clean brexit which is what people voted for in the referendum okay I, I guess so the even though that is the case the election was clearly generally people don't uh, they can't appreciate all these uh, nuances so electorate votes on you know simple points so Johnson was seen as pro brexit the Tory were pro Brexit and the Labour was anti Brexit. So the strong win for the Tories is a vote for in favor of Brexit. Okay, and as a result of that, what you're seeing is cable is rising. Okay, if you look at Euro Sterling, Euro Sterling is also, if you see the magnitude of the rise in cable. Okay, some of the connection has come back. So you can see here for this time of day, cable is pretty active actually, and this thing is keep it's moving around quite a bit. Okay, for this time, this is a very odd time because it's Asian time. Okay, nobody has come in. Zurich has not even come in. So there is no liquidity and in general, it's not supposed to be so liquid, but it's much more active because these are election results are coming in and you're seeing the move. Uh, just to give you an idea of how dramatic the move is in the cable here. You can see this uh, this palette display that I have. You can see how this dramatic this move is. Yes, sir. In the on the five minute charts, you can see it has pretty much moved from one uh, about two hundred from one thirty sixty to one thirty four sixty. So about four hundred points. Okay, very big move uh, for this time of day for cable. This is reacting to the in, in, uh, election results. Now I'll just show you one more thing. The time, uh, if you remember what I showed you, uh, what when I showed you uh, when I explained non stationarity. Remember the term non stationarity when I pulled up a chart of crude oil prices and I showed you how the behavior of crude oil prices changed dramatically yes. right you remember that okay so what I'm trying to show you here is part of the reason for that is you can see how dramatically the the midpoint is shifting the uh, the market is moving around so uh, what is this th this thing is called this full thing is the the full market depth this is the full market depth okay and this the best bid and offer is this is the top of the book right this is actually what a book looks like on an exchange server where everybody's putting in their orders bids and offers the full depth of the market book you can see so normally exchanges what they do is they'll give you this this data maybe for free or they'll charge you maybe ten dollars for this data but if you want to see the full book they'll charge you maybe twenty dollars so they have tiered pricing for different levels of information so you can see this moving around now let's look at now let's let's talk about why this uh, once again proves so what I had shown you is if we go back to the crude oil prices if I just briefly go back to the crude oil prices um, this is similar to that a similar idea what makes market so unpredictable because the market keeps shifting around and it's very difficult to predict all right so here what we had shown you is how from for almost 20 years uh, this market had been fairly stable very narrow trading range can you see there are two distinct phases in the crude oil chart at least two distinct phases we may be going into a different phase once again from this so you can see here it was very tightly controlled very little volatility okay and the Saudis were complaining all the time that the oil price is very low but they couldn't do anything because even though even though at that time there was no US shale output the US was not a dominant player in the oil markets okay it was only the Russians and the South and OPEC right so uh, so all the the uh, Arab countries plus Venezuela but they didn't they couldn't do anything with all their crying and uh, complaining they couldn't do anything to influence the oil price that's how big the market is and then suddenly you see that the price movement changes dramatically so this is what essentially if you want to visually remember what non stationarity is you will remember this chart because pictures are easier to remember okay this is a real chart I didn't make it up okay this is a real data so you can see how can you see the na qualitatively na different nature of the movement between this phase and this phase when it goes up here like this and comes down all the way till here you can see okay even here can you see that the nature of the movement is quite different qualitatively it's much more volatile can you see that yes 
Well, I'm not getting strong responses. Yes, yes, yes. So you have to. The movement is much more volatile. Can you see that? Right. The phase has changed. It's like it's almost like you're looking at a different animal, right? So this is what happens in the market. This is what non-stationarity essentially means visually. Okay. That essentially the sudden the whole nature of market movement will suddenly get destabilized and it'll move into a new regime. So this is called a regime change. It's like it's moving from here to one regime, which is a very very quiet low wall period, and then suddenly it moves. Into a new regime, which is a very high wall period. So that's what makes market. And you know, you know, you have no way of knowing when this is going to happen. When this regime change is going to happen, this is actually in statistical parlance. It's called a regime change. When you study non-stationarity, when a market, you know, the nature of the distribution changes, the uh, statistical parameters change dramatically. Okay, the SD and all that changes dramatically. That's called a re regime change. And you have no way of knowing when this is going to come. Okay, histo today we know it because we are looking at the past but when you're doing predictive modeling for the future you have no way of knowing when this is going to happen okay so this is what makes and if you if you look at economic data also you will get the same phenomena if you look at different degrees of movement you will always get the same phenomena you'll see suddenly that markets change so now let's go back to the uh, cable we'll just only look at the cable but I'll show you, uh, let's look at the cable and first give you an example for what, wh why I'm saying this is, uh, let's look at uh, a daily chart. Now you see what makes markets so difficult to predict. Okay, now look at this. What is this movement? What do you think? What is it? Uh, this is 23rd June 2016, around 20, mid June 2016, late June 2016. What do you think? What is there any major event that would have caused this drop? June 2016, what happened? <coughs> That was the Brexit referendum. Okay, so the point I'm trying to illustrate here is you see how dramatically markets change. Okay, it's as if you have an equation and suddenly you have a model with an equation and suddenly what somebody does is in let's say it's a model with one exogenous variable. Okay, in this case that's Brexit and on the endogenous side you have the movement of the directional movement of the cable. Okay, if you imagine a model like that it's as if what I'm going to show you is as if the, somebody has suddenly gone and put a minus sign before the exog exogenous variable change the impact completely around okay so if you see what happened here initially the perception of the market was around the time that the brexit referendum happened and even after that for many uh, years actually that the perception the market's perception was that brexit was bad for the pound that brexit was bad for the uk economy you see everybody was doing fear mongering you remember that i don't know if you're following the debate even the governor of the bank of england was engaging in a lot of fear mongering don't vote for brexit because it's going to cause a disaster economic disaster and all that if the UK moves away from the EU. So after, that's why if you see and when this is the top of the market, this is the Brexit referendum and then it crashed after the referendum came in with for Brexit, pro Brexit vote, right? Then it crashed again here. If you see the low that is being made here, you're not able to see it because this thing. Okay. Now, if you see, I'm not going to go there because it will come and show us the, this, this low that I'm trying to show you the lowest point on the chart around September 2016. This low was actually made in very early morning Asian trading in this kind of illiquid situation. Okay. What we have now, you see, once again, it has gone down, right? 58 half is the price. So this, you have to keep moving this to be able to see the the top of the book along with the market depth nearby market depth so uh, so in in early Asian time this drop happened why did this drop happen because Theresa May who was then the Prime Minister she made some statements you know you know the discussion about the hard brexit and the soft brexit hmm? There is a deal Brexit and no deal Brexit. Yeah, so the no deal Brexit is basically referred to as a hard Brexit, which means the UK just tells the EU to get lost and they just get out of the EU with no, uh, you know, agreement as such. Okay. Uh, in this case, Boris Johnson has negotiated an agreement, but that came later. So at this point, Theresa May made some statements which were misinterpreted, I think, slightly, to, in to indicate that she was in favor of a no deal Brexit, which is a hard Brexit, which is basically a quite an acrimonious, it's like an acrimonious divorce, right, rather than an amicable settlement. So therefore, again, the market at this point, the market was again looking at Brexit as being bad for the UK, bad for the pound. Okay, because if you see a hard Brexit, that means it's like a pure form of Brexit. So that was seen as bad for the pound. So they sold off the pound in early Asian trading and there was a lot of liquidity problems also. So actually, we don't even know what the exact traded low was over at this point because it was very, very hectic. Okay, so this is what is happening. Okay, so by and large, 
uh, up until here the market was behaving in the same way that up until very recently till about this time the market was behaving in the same way that whenever the, there was any news showing that uh, brexit was more likely a no deal brexit was more likely the pound would be sold off and whenever there was supposed to be a, a you know a reversal of brexit there's a chance of a reversal of brexit the pound would appreciate is that right are you following okay so the the psychology of the market was that brexit is bad for the uh, for the pound and the uk and uh, no deal uh, and uh, reversing brexit is good okay so that's why that but now suddenly you see as boris johnson's polls started getting favorable suddenly around this time the behavior of the market changes okay that if now it because boris johnson was pushing for a brexit although not really a hard brexit so he was pushing for this and now the market behavior was starting to change and if you see what happens here if you go back to this you see the pal you can see the full impact you can see how important this high is this is a high that can be seen even on the weekly charts this high has been broken can you see that by this dramatic move after the election so as they see the tories gaining a majority and boris is seen as pro brexit whereas labor is anti brexit so this is seen as a vote in favor of brexit this election it's a very strong majority that they're likely to get okay historic kind of majority so therefore the market is now buying the pound can you see how the market's behavior has totally changed the input is the same it's as if somebody went into the model and put in a minus sign before the exogenous variable which is the probability of a hard brexit okay so earlier it was negative for the pound now this probability of a uh, of a brexit okay uh, brexit uh, moving away from the eu this is now seen as good for the pound are you able to follow this and if you listen to the market commentary i can also tell you what the market is going to say how they're going to explain it because the market experts are very good at explaining things after they've happened okay there's always an explanation because nobody wants to be caught saying that i don't know why this happened no one's ever going to say that okay unless you're a, a pure technician in which case you say that i really don't think anybody knows why this happened okay which is i think is the correct uh, assessment that no one really knows why this happened the people keep talking like this because they can't accept the fact that they don't know why it happened okay are you following what i'm saying or is it all go over going over your head okay so the way if you listen to the market commentary without listening to the commentary i can tell you how the market is going to uh, interpret this they're going to say now this is positive the market is seeing this as positive for the sterling because it brings certainty because the market the general other thing that the other theme that you will see is that the market is not supposed to like uncertainty okay so if you see how dramatically the market is appreciated if you see here if you see the changes percentage changes you can see from the previous day so cable is down so here you can see cable is up about 2.2% overnight which is quite a big move all right and uh, euro sterling is down so this means a stronger cable a stronger sterling is everyone clear about that yes uh, others you are clear that euro sterling falling means stronger sterling why why i'm confused cable going up i can understand is stronger sterling but euro sterling falling why is it stronger sterling can you explain you're nodding your head but you're not able to explain yes who is going to explain anjum can you explain i am confused cable going up 2.2% is stronger sterling euro sterling falling 1.77% why is it stronger sterling can you explain is my question clear yes very simple explanation yes anjum you are also not clear your whatsapp does not give any answer okay okay what is your <laughs> who else is going to answer yeah what is it sir so, sterling is getting stronger that means euro is getting weaker and the price was falling down that's why the, uh, the sterling was strong because the price was of the euro was going down okay good yeah so your articulation can be improved but you have understood the point the point that she is making is that in it's very simple in euro sterling what is the base base currency euro, euro. okay so when we say minus 1.77 that means we are referring to this rate that means 1 euro is buying 1.77 less sterling that means the euro is getting weak if the base asset is dropping so whenever these numbers are shown they are shown for the base asset so if the base asset is dropping that means the terms asset is rising and here the terms asset is sterling okay so that power's answer is correct okay but you have to improve your articulation 
but your logic is correct okay so now you can see how the sterling is appreciating as both okay both the euro and the sterling these are important points okay uh, now so so this to understand now you can see how uh, dramatically so this is what I want to illustrate that this is something else you learn about markets that the same discussion the same point the reaction of the market has completely turned around 180 degrees okay over a period of time suddenly the assessment of the market has totally turned around okay this will be explained as being uh, because of a removal of uncertainty now you have certainty there's a clear mandate okay because Theresa May also called an election earlier around this time and that time she didn't get a very clean majority and the market started dropping etc so there was and she was also not at all in favor of a clean break of a, of a strong brexit so there were all these problems okay so this is just a discussion of these points i'll just show you the brief uh, i'll just briefly show you the euro sterling movement so you can also appreciate that okay is this a useful discussion you're learning not not a very strong affirmative <laughs> not a very affirmative uh, assessment okay so you can see how how dramatic the move in euro sterling already had started falling okay and it's broken and you can see here euro sterling has broken a pretty important support because this is the highest low this high has been exceeded by this high so this was the highest high so very long uptrend on the daily charts has actually been broken this high exceed so this is the highest high from here and this is the low highest low from which the new high was made and that has now been broken it was already broken before this okay so you can see how this dramatic move uh, how the uh, move is on, on the euro sterling as well so sterling so now the market sees this as a good thing for sterling so we'll close the order books we'll close at least we'll close the uh, euro sterling order book then we may come back to this a later on at a later time all right so so now we go back to our uh, discussion of maybe we can close this also at this point we're not going to discuss this anymore all right so let's go back to our discussion of the case what we were discussing uh, i'll just show you one more thing uh, what i was showing you to complete our discussion of euro dollar futures we'll actually have to do a little bit more on that Okay, so if you remember here, this is 1986. This data series starts from 1986. I was telling you that the euro dollar three month uh, three month LIBOR, okay, which is the underlying asset for the three month euro dollar futures contract that you see here. Okay, this is your GE, right? This is your three month euro dollar futures. Okay, for this, the underlying asset is three month US dollar LIBOR. Okay, the cash market deposits in London. All right, so this uh, this is the rate over here the three month the US dollar LIBOR but because this is a short term interest rate this is a three month interest rate it's an offshore it's an offshore dollar interest rate okay it's not a US based interest rate it's an offshore rate based on the dollar deposits in London okay and uh, I wanted to just show you the connection because I mentioned it to you the other day but I didn't show you the other chart which is here which is if you see the effective federal funds rate which is the overnight rate for um, basically this is the equivalent of our repo rate in india if you look at the policy rate if you're asking about the interest rate what is the main monetary policy rate in india the answer is the repo rate right so uh, here the equivalent of the repo rate in india the u.s equivalent is the effective federal funds rate which is basically a volume weighted average of rates of uh, rates now that there's one difference here the repo rate involves borrowing from the reserve bank of india okay whereas this effective federal fund rate reflects borrowings between the banks in the interbank money market okay but it's the same kind of it's still the it's the equivalent policy rate this is what the federal reserve targets the central bank you guys have done monetary policy operation of monetary policy have you guys done it monetary policy transmission open market operations when the government pumps in money by buying securities by by doing repo uh, repos and reverse repos you haven't done all this yes, repos reverse repos you don't know all this yes, that if i'm doing a transaction with kanika if it's a repo for me then it's a reverse repo for her yes sir. okay so here she, what we will what will have if kanika is borrowing money she will in this, this, this transaction has two legs okay so in the first leg of the transaction it's a repo for her so first that's why it's a repo because she agrees to repurchase the securities later so in the first leg of the transaction she sells me the securities so i sell her money since i buy the securities and she's selling the government's uh, the debt securities all right 
so i'm i am buying the debt security she's selling the debt security so if i'm buying debt security i'm selling money right so she gets the money so this is a form of secured lending you haven't done all these transactions repo you, you've done repos right you know the structure so repo and reverse repo is just like uh, one person's depending on whose perspective it is so in this case it's a repo for her and it's a reverse repo for me it's a repo for her because she agrees as part of the transaction this transaction is not complete it has two legs so if it's a three month borrowing usually these money market repos are quite short term usually it's about overnight overnight is very active and then it's up to about 14 days or so all right so then what will happen is she will agree over uh, after 14 days she agrees that she will buy back the security she sold me right and suppose she sold me the security that hundred dollars a piece in the first leg then she'll buy back the security that $105 a leg. I'm just giving an example. When she buys back the security after 14 days, I'm just giving a crude example with very large uh, differences in numbers. So she will buy back at $105 a, a piece, okay? At per, per uh, bond, she'll buy back at $105. Now what will happen? So that $5 extra that I'm making, because I'm buying at $100 on the first leg, okay? And I'm selling at maybe we should do this on the, so do a repo transaction. We should do this, I think, because I don't think everybody understands clearly. Is that correct? You understand clearly. Everyone understands clearly. Repo transaction, how it works. Okay, let's try and do it one more time just to be honest. I'm not getting confident uh, responses. When I look at people's faces, I'm not getting confident responses. Okay, we'll try and do this here once again. Okay, so what is happening is, say, okay, so the party ones, uh, party ones, let's look at party ones uh, thing. What is happening is minus 100, okay? And on the plus side, you have, um, sorry, uh, in this case, she gets plus 100, okay? So let's just draw it as 100. And then she gets uh, minus bonds, okay? We'll just write it like this. So what party one is doing, this is the party for whom it's a repo. This party is a repo. And let's say this is party two. And for party two, it's a reverse repo. Okay, yes, so this is a reverse repo for this party. Same transaction looked at from one person's point of view is re repo, another person's point of view is re reverse repo. Okay, so what is happening? This is party two. Okay, so uh, in India, this would be the central bank. All right, now what happens here for this party? This party wants to borrow, right? This is secured borrowing, it's a form of secured borrowing. We also call it collateralized borrowing. Okay, so uh, this party will get 100 rupees, okay, $100, and it will sell the bonds. Okay? And this party obviously will buy the bonds. This will buy the bonds. <coughs> okay, now we can't write or put a comma here. Okay, so it'll buy the bonds and it will sell the money. Okay. It will sell the money. Okay. So it's buying bonds and selling money. After 14 days, the transactions are reversed. This is a 14 day repo, right? So the transactions are reversed after 14 days. <coughs> now, of course, the prices are gonna be different. We're gonna change the prices. All right. So what is going to happen is this is the price that she's going to pay for the borrowing. She's now going to pay $105. This is a crude example just to make create a big difference between the numbers. Okay. Now what is happening? So what is the is this clear now the transaction? So the bonds position is squared. Everybody's bond position is squared plus bonds minus bonds. The bond is only acting as collateral. All right. So and now here let's call this guy the borrower. And this is called this the lender, right? So we'll put this into one box. So we'll call this, we'll make this a box. We'll give it a nice color, which stands out. All right, and we will call this repo um, as secured lending. When I say repo, obviously it includes reverse repo also. Okay, so repo as secured lending. 
and we're gonna just okay so this is your display now what is the interest cost five five is the interest cost okay so let's call this we are going to give this another set of names we are going to we are going to use these names later as well near date no, this is the near date we are going to use these terms later on in future spreads also um, we are going to call this near date this is all being put into your uh, uh, spreadsheet okay so near date and far date these are the terms we are going to use because there are a couple of other transactions which are structurally identical to a repo transaction which is a foreign exchange swap when we do a foreign exchange swap when we get into the module of swaps a foreign exchange swap is structurally absolutely identical to a repo transaction all right there's also an interest component in that so uh, and the only thing is instead of doing bonds and money you're doing money and money because it's an fx transactions both the assets are money so yen and yen and sterling dollar and uh, aussie okay usd and aussie whatever canadian and japanese but both are going to be so one bond is going to get replaced one is going to become a currency so fx swap is structurally identical to a repo transaction and there's nothing another thing which is a future spread an intermonth future spread that's also we're going to study that con uh, uh, structure they are all three are identical structurally uh, the transactions are all identical so it's very important that you understand because repo is a very basic monetary policy tool i don't think everybody understood it clearly okay so i think it's useful that we have this discussion to make sure that everybody understands clearly 105 so five is the interest cost okay so here kanika is borrowing five uh, hundred dollars okay by paying five dollars for interest cost for whatever the repo period is okay so this is how the system works okay you pay back the interest without instead of giving an explicit interest you buy back the bonds at a higher price and that's the interest that you're paying is everyone clear everyone 100 percent clear about the bar, uh, repo structure ritesh you're clear yes, all right so this is a very important type of transaction to understand uh this is the uh, repo transaction and how this is our repo rate is our policy rate yeah yeah give her the mic Sir? yes so my question is in both the cases the lender is in profit like yeah so lender is in profit in the sense of when i'm lending you money <laughs> I need to get interest, right? But sir, we have studied that reverse repo rate is when RBI wants uh, funds from banks. They they borrow money from the banks. Then they borrow money from the banks. See, remember, re one minute. Remember that repo for the borrower. Okay, repo is for the borrower. Why? But the repo comes from the word. These are actually the full term is repurchase agreements. Okay, let's call. Let's use the same full term. Repo name comes from. I don't know if you knew this also. This comes from. This is the U.S. Uh, again, most of these developments are. The proper name is repurchase agreements. Okay repo comes from repurchase agreement so why is it a repurchase agreement because here kanika is agreeing to repurchase the bonds at 105 dollars a piece okay she's selling it and she's agreeing to repurchase at 105 dollars a piece okay so you can also say that even from my points it's a repurchase because she's agreed to repurchase you can say that also but the main thing to understand is basically this who is selling the who is selling the in the case of a repo transaction okay in the case of a repo transaction there's only one currency flow happening so who's getting the currency inflow in the beginning and the in the near leg on the near leg this is also called the near leg there are two legs to this transaction this transaction has near legs and let's call this also uh, let's use this term also leg okay uh, this is also a leg so it's standing on two legs this transaction all right so near leg who is getting the money who's getting the cash inflow in the near leg that you have to identify okay that person is the borrower yes everyone's clear okay so one side is a bond one side is cash so whoever's getting the cash inflow on the near leg is the borrower and it's a profit obviously because the person who's lending you money is going to demand interest he's not going to lend money free of charge so that's what i'm saying according to that borrower should come above 105 on the other side it is confusing no no i didn't sorry i didn't understand 
On this side. Sir, I understood, but I think you say that D in first case, then there's 100. Party 1. Yeah. No. Let it be. <laughs> That's a Beatles song, actually. Let it be. <laughs> yeah. Like in first case, when there's 100 uh, intro and bonds are going out. In that case, borrower, uh, you have written borrower is right. But in the second case, you should write borrower on the other side and the lender on the this side. Because otherwise, it is consistent. You're talking about here. Yes, I guess. Here. Here I should write borrower to show this. Yes, sir. Okay, but this is not actually borrowing. This money that is coming back to me is my P plus I. This is my P plus I. I am the lender. The P plus I has to come back to me. When you put a fixed deposit at Access Bank, at the end of three months, the P plus I has to come back to you. Right? So we don't call you a borrower. Because the P plus I is coming back to you after the end of the loan period, we don't call you a borrower. You are still a lender. You are getting the P plus I back. Here this is P. This inflow to the borrower is only P. And at the end of the lending transaction, when the money comes back to the lender, this is P plus I. Right? So therefore, we should not call them a lender, okay? But good, this is what you should do. Any confusion that you have, you should ask the question so that you can clear your understanding, okay? Otherwise, what happens, oh, you don't understand. Okay, I forget, no problem. I just relax. And then after three, four sessions, you don't know what is happening in the class. Yes, Anjum also has a question. This is a great day. I think we should all clap. Anjum has a question. Yes. Suddenly, she has woken up from her WhatsApp and she is doing asking. Okay, ask, ask, ask. Yes. Yes. Okay, quiet, quiet. Let's hear. On the second transaction, because uh, in the uh, on the second case, uh, even uh, the uh, repo one will get P plus I. You are talking about this side, this side. Yes, in the second. Case. Here. Yes. So I am actually excluding Parul. No, but Parul has already uh, withdrawn her uh, objection. <laughs> She, so now you are no longer agreeing with Parul, you are coming up with a similar objection. Because she has already withdrawn her objection. Now she has understood why I am not calling that person a borrower. Why I am not calling P2 a borrower? Because the money that P2 is getting back is P plus I. That is what a lender gets back at the end of the loan period? Yes. Which, okay, one minute. She. She is saying second transaction. There is no second transaction. Second leg. Second leg or far date. Either you say far leg or uh, or uh, second leg or you say far date. No, I call into reverse leg. The lender will be the borrower. Yes. Because no, I don't know what definition you have. You can look at it from either side. Okay, I look at it from the side that basically when you are borrowing, okay, because it's from the perspective of the person who is getting the money in flow. Okay, you call this a repo and you call this is how traditionally it's defined. Okay, so uh, but the point here is always a reverse repo and repo are always it depends on whose perspective you take, right? Whether you take the borrower's perspective or the lender's. It's more important to be clear about who's the borrower and who's the lender. And the borrower is the person who is experiencing the cash inflow on the near leg. This is clear. That is more important to be clear about than who is borrowing. Okay, and who then therefore you figure out the interest rate based on the cash inflow that is happening to the lender at the end on the far leg. This is clear. Okay, so repo and reverse repo depends on your perspective. Okay. All right, so it comes from the word repurchase agreement because the person who's selling the securities, the person who's selling the securities agrees to repurchase the, uh, the securities. Okay, so it's a security sale with a repurchase agreement attached to it. So it is one transaction. It is not treated as two transactions. One transaction with two legs. Okay, all right. So uh, this is our repo transaction example. Okay, so here we're talking about policy rates. Okay, so repo is a form of borrowing very common in money markets. When the central banks conduct money market 
market, open market operations you heard of? Open market operations, these are all conducted through repos and reverse repos. Okay, so in future we'll just say repos, we're not going to use the same, but it's the same thing. Okay, so uh, they are all conducted through uh, whether it's in the US or in India, they are conducted through open market operations through repo transactions by adding and draining funds. All right, so how the Federal Reserve keeps uh, the this is the money market rate, the benchmark money market rate in the US. This you can see the again, you remember we talked about cyclicality. This again, I didn't cook up this data. This data is real data from 1955. You can see the effective federal funds rate. This is the rate at which uh, banks in uh, New York have been borrowing federal funds, which is basically reserve funds. You understand what reserve bank funds are? Yes. We showed you that concentric circles, remember? That you have the central bank in the middle, which is there in every country pretty much, all the Anglo-Saxon countries. Even the non-Anglo-Saxon countries have the system. Most modern economies have the system. Central bank in the middle, first circle is all the commercial banks who are connected in India, we call them scheduled commercial banks. And then the second circle is all the customers, the natural persons and the artificial persons who have accounts with the uh, central bank, uh, with the commercial banks. Is this clear, the system? So these commercial, this is the rate for commercial banks borrowing from each other. And what the Federal Reserve does is they try to keep this within a Fed funds target range. When the policy meetings happen in the Federal Reserve, like we won, we had one just a couple of days ago, okay, they kept the rates unchanged. So they have a range for the Federal, uh, for the Fed, Fed funds rate. What the US Federal Reserve targets, unlike our Reserve Bank, which targets a repo rate, okay, uh, the Federal Reserve targets the interbank money market borrowing rate, uh, borrowing rate, okay, into a borrowing and lending rate. This is the F, this is called the Fed funds rate or the effective Federal funds rate. Okay, so when the the Federal Reserve is setting up policy decisions, they are deciding to target a particular range for the Fed funds rate, which is basically keeping money market rates in a particular range. They won't want to let it get out of hand. So if it gets too high, then they will add funds through open market operations. If it gets too low, then they will drain funds through open market operations. And open market operations you already know now, okay, through repo transactions. Is everyone clear about this? So it's very important to the US is the most <coughs> important economy in the world and it will remain so in your lifetime also. I don't see anybody overtaking them. Forget about my lifetime. Even in your lifetime, no one's going to overtake them, okay? Yes, so, um, unless they get some real hardcore socialist candidates who take the country in a leftward direction. Otherwise, the US will remain dominant, okay? Nobody's even close. So, now, very important to understand the operation of U.S. capital markets, okay, and the whole financial system in the U.S. So, this is the federal funds rate. You can see also notice the cyclicality. Can you see how almost perfectly cyclical uh, movement in interest rates? Okay, and these are all real data. Okay, and you can see here all the stuff we studied: higher highs, higher lows, and then if you zoom in. You see the same pattern of higher highs and higher lows at multiple degrees of movement. Can you see that? We don't, we don't have multiple uh, time frame charts, but you can already see it here itself. Like this is a big down here, but within this big down, you can see down, up, down, up, down, up, down, it's an up and down again. You can see if you zoom into this part, you can see all the same patterns again. Is this clear? You can see it everywhere. Economic data, financial asset prices, data, asset price data. Everywhere you'll see this phenomenon, cyclicality, and then this put pattern of uptrends and downtrends. Okay, you'll see this everywhere. So once again, you can see from 1986 onwards. If you look at it, from 1986 around this 1986, around here. Okay. So from here, if you look at this pattern here, this this pattern, you can see it reflected here also. Can you see this same pattern? Two different interest rates okay this is basically an overnight interest rate but see how the similar the pattern is from 1986 okay same kind of pattern here same pattern but this looks much more zoomed in because that's all the data that this particular series has are you following so the the point I was I'm just visually uh, con, I mean uh, proving to you once again the statement that I made the other day that is that the three month uh, London interbank of the three month LIBOR rate will track fairly closely uh, the uh, effective federal funds rate which is the Fed funds policy rate because that's a very short term rate you know overnight to 14 days and so a three month rate can't be too far out of line with the 14 day interest rate 
this is clear so uh, you have if you wanted to take a longer view on LIBOR if you because you don't have let's say so one of the workarounds you have is you know these two will fairly uh, will track fairly closely so if you get into a situation like this where your LIBOR database is only up to 1986 but your Fed funds databases go, goes much, much further back to 1955 so you can use the big swings on the Fed funds in, in a chart to basically proxy the uh, implied swings in LIBOR you can assume that the long-term LIBOR chart would also look pretty much like this okay is, are you following what I'm saying okay so it's a proxy so this is for our euro dollar, euro dollar discussion that we com uh, we already completed the other day okay now I just want to go back this is already there everyone on board so far any questions yes give him some water I think he's struggling <laughs> okay <laughs> where did we have this okay guys one more thing okay let's go back now let's go back to our discussion um, where we have um, okay so this should be again another maybe we can make it a little bit lighter and we'll just have another okay let me explain one more thing here um, we need to put in one more, right? We'll, we'll put it here. All right. Okay. So let's see if we can shift these cells down. It should be insert, right? Insert shell cells and shift down. Does it work without? Okay. 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 All right. Okay. So we won't do that. We'll do it here. Okay. So let's ma make sure we understand one thing here. The uh, I've already explained this towards the end of the video yesterday. Because after the class, Saroni was asking a question and she was not clear about uh, how the underlying position changes, uh, how the total position changes as a result of your hedges. So let's quickly run through that once again. Okay. So your underlying position is, uh, this is the total. Okay. This is the total of your uh, underlying position and hedge positions. What is this? Okay, this is all the underlying positions here and this is all the hedge positions here. We're not going to change the underlying position. Okay. All right. So understand this here first. So you first start with your, now we are going back to your case. We're going back to your case and just trying to confirm very quickly, just trying to confirm that we understand what is going on. Why uh, the, because now you'll have to start thinking in terms of uh, you already walk into the room, you walk in with the underlying positions. That's why it's a passive risk book. Okay, the risks are already there. Now you have to manage a hedge book in such a way that your total losses are minimized or your total profits are maximized, whatever whatever way you want to look at it, right? So you have to manage the total, you, and, uh, you can't touch the underlying positions. So you have to take a view on the KRF markets and being conscious of your underlying positions in the KRF markets, you have to therefore accordingly take action, either do nothing or buy or sell as a hedge okay you will have to create hedge positions so that the goal is the hedge position should offset the losses on the underlying position so that your total losses are minimized okay and so so let's look at the idea of how the uh, positions work let's look at how just be clear about that okay you can play around with this on your own so you start out with 20 when we're looking at the oil positions uh, you start out with 25 contracts long because the oil position is uh, the oil position is 25,000 barrels. So that's 25 contracts long. All right. So uh, this is your in your uh, calc sheet. Okay. In the futures, all this is happening in the futures. So maybe I should rename the sheet as magma because that will give you the connection that this is for this particular case, all the discussions that we are having here on this point. So you start out with the underlying position of 25. So let's say you sell three contracts. <laughs> What happens to your underlying position? Your total position? This is your total position. Okay. Is everyone following this? We can put this here. I think we don't want to put anything else here. Total position. All right. Is everyone following here? Underlying. Okay. This is already written here. Actually, I didn't need to put this. We can put this here. All right. Hedge position, underlying position, everybody understands and that's your total position. All right. So you had an initially your underlying position, your total position was 25 long plus 25. Then you sold three, three contracts in your hedge book. Okay. So your net position now becomes 
total position net total position is 22 is everyone clear about that okay now let's say what happens is suppose you sold let's make this a little bit bigger let's make it like 10 contracts so we can see a clear contrast so you sold 10 contracts why did you sell 10 contracts because you had now we are trying to understand the impact of what we are trying to understand is basically continuing from yesterday's discussion we are trying to uh, confirm for you once again why an active uh, or a dynamic hedging program let's use the word dynamic and static why a dynamic hedging program is more risky okay why is it more risky what happens okay so let's understand this so you're running a dynamic hedging program now you initially sold 10 uh, contracts because you looked at the oil chart let's go back to us oil you looked at the oil chart and you came to a view that this thing was going to drop okay and let's make this a little bit smaller so we can have a little bit more granularity okay you are looking at this now all right so you 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 sold uh, you sold 10 contracts here because you thought that uh, in a in a very short term uh, you know playing very short term moves you thought that this is going to come down to say 57 okay so at 59.45 you sold 10 contracts because you are taking very short term views and you think that this is going to come down to 57 okay so you want to basically uh, at least hedge a little bit of your exposure because your exposure is long 25 contracts so you want to hedge a little bit so you sell 10 contracts on the hedge book yes everyone's following okay now your view turns out to be correct the market falls from 59.45 to 57 okay but that's the extent that you were of the decline that you expected you don't expect this to break you expect this to eventually again rise back to 62 so let's say if you form these kinds of uh, clear intricate views so this gives you an idea of how you have to take views and markets you have to take very precise views not the kind of global you see when you li listen to experts on tv they talk in very global language you know and they are not very precise at all but in real life when you're actually having to manage money <coughs> as a, either as a speculative trader or as a hedger you will have to take very precise views on markets if you want to really do well in your in your I mean, if you want to perform well right uh, so you your view is very specific you don't expect this low of 55 to break but you expect a move down to around 56 and a half 57 from 59 and a half so that's still about uh, three three dollars per barrel you want to make make sure that you hedge yourself for this drop so you hedge about 10 uh, you 10 contracts you sell 10 contracts okay so your position goes down to net position is now plus 15 yes so your view turns out to be correct the market now drops to 56 and a half and you now feel that this is going to now turn around and go back to 62 right so if it's going to go back to 62 remember all decisions are based on your views right so and your views are fallible but you act on your views so in that case you don't want to remain because remember you went short 10 contracts on the hedge book right is everyone following yes, you went short 10 contracts at 59.45 so if now it's fallen to 56 and a half so you're making three dollars per barrel right so on 10,000 barrels you're making three dollars each per, uh, three dollars per barrel now you don't want this to you don't want to remain short 10 contracts because your view is that the market is going to turn around from here and move up to 62 in that case your 59.45 shorts of 10 contracts will lose money at 62 yes or no yes Ganotra you agree yes. okay why is your bag over here it looks like you're trying to hide what you're doing you're trying to hide your whatsapp put your bag down so that we can see what you're doing all right so uh, so what do you do now is this clear? are you following the logic you sold 10 contracts at 59 and a half your view was it was gonna come to 56 and a half it does come there but now you feel that's gonna turn around and go to 62 so now what you're gonna do is because you are being uh, you're running a dynamic hedging program you are now allowed to unhedge initially when you sold 10 contracts here you put on a hedge now you're going to unhedge because you view your view is this is going to go back up okay since your underlying position is long you would rather be hedging at higher levels and you don't want to in incur a loss on this so now what you do is you buy back your 10 contracts you buy back your 10 contracts which means on the hedge book you do plus 10 what happens to your total position? Zero. Zero. 
टोटल पोजिशन इज हेज पोजिशन प्लस थर्टी फाइव नो फर्स्ट मेक श्योर दैट सो इट्स गुड एक्सरसाइज वंस अगेन आई वॉन्ट मेक श्योर एवरीबडी इज क्लियर ओके ऑल दो इट इज ऑलरेडी डिस्कस्ड इन दस एट द एंड ऑफ द वीडियो यस टूडे वेन सलोनी इज आस्किंग दिस क्वेश्चन आई एक्सप्लेन द सेम थिंग टू हर बिकॉज शी वॉज ऑल्सो गेटिंग कन्फ्यूज एंड इट्स क्वाइट नेचुरल टू गेट कन्फ्यूज बिकॉज यूर हियरिंग दिस कॉन्सेप्ट फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम सो यूर जस्ट ट्राइंग टू अरेंज द आइडियाज इन यूर हेड सो इट इज क्वाइट ओके टू गेट कन्फ्यूज दर नथिंग टू बी अशेम्ड ऑफ बट यू जस्ट मेक श्योर दैट लाइक पारोल आस्ट अ क्वेश्चन वेन शी वॉज नॉट क्लियर अबाउट समथिंग वॉज नॉट मेकिंग सेंस टू हर सो शी आस्ट अ क्वेश्चन सो नाउ इट मेक्स सेंस टू हर सो दिस हाउ यू लर्न यू कम टू क्लास एंड यू आस्क क्वेश्चन बिकॉज एवरीथिंग हेज टू बी अंडरस्टूड इन योर वे ऑफ लुकिंग एट थिंग्स पारोल के नॉट अंडरस्टैंड इट अंड द वे दट शिव अंडरस्टैंड एवरीबडीज वे ऑफ लुकिंग एट थिंग्स इज डिफरेंट सो यू हैव टू आस्क क्वेश्चन एंड मेक इट क्लियर अकॉर्डिंग टू योर ओन वे ऑफ थिंकिंग ओके सो uh who else was saying you were saying that uh, it's going to be so the the TWS requires a much stronger connection because google sheets has not reacted okay so you can see the figures right so i sold on the hedge book that always be clear the total position is the sum of positions on the underlying book the passive risk book plus the hedge book okay or you can think of underlying positions sum of all underlying positions plus sum of all uh or plus minus adjusted by the uh sum of all positions on the hedge uh, uh sum of all hedge positions sum of all underlying positions plus minus uh, sum of all hedge positions yes that's your that's always the definition of a total position so you sorry with 25 underlying position no hedge that's why your uh, your position was uh, 25 then you did minus 10 on the hedge book okay let's go back again uh, anjum is not con uh, convinced so we we change this also now you have an underlying position starting with an underlying position no hedge positions so now you have a slightly bearish view on the oil price so you sell 10 contracts so your total position is 25 because hedge position is 0 so you have a slightly negative view you sell 10 contracts on the hedge book so your total position is now 15 yes plus 15 we can call it plus 15 or uh, okay so now what you do is because your your short term view is turned out to be correct it's come to 56 and a half <coughs> sorry now you see this going back to 62 so you would rather hedge at 62 again and not incur a loss on the 59.45 shorts the 10 contracts at 59.45 if your view is correct and the market goes to 62 they will be showing a loss you don't want to have that loss okay so you unhedge okay because anyway you were playing only for this move yes when you hedged you were playing only for this move right this move has happened now your view says it's going back up so now you're since you're allowed to run you know allowed to do this because you're running a dynamic hedging program based on your risk management policy of the corporation right so now what you do is you buy 10 contracts back on the hedge book so this is a running uh, record of your hedge transactions this is a running record okay so uh, now the position now you see what happens to total position it was earlier long only 15 contracts but now it's gone back to 25 contracts okay so one of the reasons why the act dynamic writing uh, program is more risky is you are again opening up the uh, underlying positions on the hedge book you have increased your risk in that sense are you following because your risk is already defined by the underlying positions okay uh, so by your essentially the risk is defined by the total position so your total position is again gone up remember the goal of hedging which is there in your notes what is the goal of hedging to minimize to minimize risk and to bring certainty to your cash flows it is not to make a profit the goal of hedging is not to make a profit so what you have done is actually philosophically contradictory to the hedging principle which is now you have increased your risk can you see that yeah. and now you also see why uh, now you also see why uh, when i defined hedgers and speculators why did i use the word first transaction yes. because all transactions need not reduce so this is also hedging yes. it's just running a dynamic hedging program this is also hedging because they are not allowed to make this total position go above 25 are you following we will come to that that is there in your project brief as the golden rule of hedging we will just briefly cover that today but is everyone clear anjum are you clear now yes sir okay if you remember the total position is hedge position plus underlying position then you will not get confused and you have to keep track of all the hedge transactions so what is the net hedge position right now the net hedge position has gone to zero this is your total of the net hedge position you can practice on your own and do it okay so this is your net hedge position 
okay so now uh, so this is the total of the two goes back so the first reason why the dynamic hedging program is risky is because you're opening up the risk once again yes sir. okay what might happen is uh, we can see why you're saying yes sir we still have two and a half minutes okay now one of the things that can happen one minute the first part is clear yes. why is a dynamic hedging program more risky yes, because you you are periodically increasing the risk you are increasing the total risk yes. whereas in a static hedging program <coughs> you never increase the total risk the total risk always goes down or stays constant okay that's the difference everyone clear about that yes. static versus dynamic hedging program yes, yes. everyone understands yes. so Priti, what is the difference static versus that in a static program in a static program you are not allowed to buy back once you hedge that's it okay that part of the position you forget about okay so then in a, therefore you see first hand first point you see why it's more risky because you are increasing the total position risk you are increasing the total exposure once again in, be, in between and now what can happen in the market because anything can happen at 56 and a half at 56 and a half you thought the market is going back to 62 but what might happen is as soon as you buy back your 10 contracts the market can collapse to 52 yes. it can be the next price also i mean in, this is a very liquid market it won't move like that but you never know what will happen okay so it can collapse now what has happened you opened up your risk your underlying positions you increased your underlying positions now you have eight now you have straight away realized a loss of around 56 and a half say four and a half dollars per barrel on your entire underlying position because you expose the entire underlying position is this clear so that's why this is much more risky and the other reason it's risky is because you can actually make losses right if you buy if you buy at 59.47 let's say if you if you sell at 59.46 after that the market might go up which we showed you yesterday that's the discussion we had go back to yesterday's video and discuss see that when Kushbu was asking this question the example I gave her was that if this goes you sell it here and then it goes above this high then you become very bullish so what and you see this going to hundred dollars okay so you decide to eat the loss on this 59 half to this part you sold 10 contracts here you will buy them back at 63 you will realize a loss okay you realize a loss this loss has to be funded this is just like your risk capital as Tarun pointed out this is just like your risk capital for speculative trading which we discussed you have five million dollars of risk capital you have to plan your risk accordingly this becomes exactly that kind of risk are you following yes, sir. so these are the reasons why an act a dynamic hedging program is more risky than a static hedging program but you are being allowed in this project please get ready because we'll have to start the project soon you better be tracking all these markets you better get to know what is happening go to the cme pages for each of the contracts yes. there's a lot of fundamental information technical information read it try to understand how people analyze markets yes get yourself into the groove this is like basically the this is like the net practice or the you know before wimbledon starts there they are practicing serving and all that so this is what is happening now okay so okay get ready okay so with the pearl